It's the Cube, covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. And now your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Moscone Center, everybody. This is the Cube Silicon Angle's continuous production of VMworld 2015. Brian Biles is here. He's the CEO and co-founder of Datrium. Brian, of course, from Data Domain fame. David Floyer and I are really excited to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. No, it's great to see you guys again. So, it's been a while. Coming out of stealth, right, it's been a while. You've been, you've been busy, right? You Data Domain, worked at EMC for a while, kind of disappeared, got really busy again, and here you are. You got new hats. Got new, new look. hats, yeah, yeah. So tell us about Daytream. Fundamentally, to catch up to you guys on ties. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're big on ties <laughs> on the East Coast. Ah, you too. Well, he's even more East than I am, but even though he lives out in California. But uh, yeah, tell us about Daytream. Fundamentally different. Fundamentally different from other kinds of storage. Um, different kind of founding team. I, so I was a founder of Data Domain, and uh, Hugo Patterson, the CTO there, uh, EMC fellow, became uh, CTO for us. We hadn't. When we left EMC, we weren't sure what we were going to do. We ended up running into two VMware principal engineers who had been there 10 or 12 years working on all kinds of stuff. Um, and they believed that there was a, a market gap on scalable storage for VMs. So we got together, uh, we knew something about storage, they knew something about VMs, and three years later, Datrium is uh, at its first trade show. So talk more about that, that game. I mean, it happens all the time, right? You guys, alpha geeks, no, no offense to that term, it's a term of endearment. You know, it's all right, I'm a marketing guy. Tech <laughs> athlete, right? <laughs> so they get together and they sort of identify these problems and they, they're able to sniff them out at the root level. So what really, can you describe that problem in, in more detail? Sure, um, so broadly there are two kinds of storage, right? There's sort of arrays and emerging, there's hyperconverged they approach things in a very different way. In arrays, there tends to be a bottleneck in the controller, the, the electronics that, that do the data services, this, the RAID and the snapshotting and cloning and compression and DDoP and whatever. And increasingly, that takes more and more compute. So Intel is you know, helping every year, but it's still a bottleneck. And when, the, when you run out, it's a cliff, and you have to do a pretty expensive upgrade or migrate the data to a different place. And that's sticky and takes a long time. So in reaction, uh, hyperconverged has emerged as an alternative, and it you know it has the benefit of killing the array completely, but it may have overcorrected. So it has some trade-offs that a lot of people don't like. Uh, for example, if a host goes down, you know the host has assumed all the data management problems that arrays used to have. So you have to migrate the data or rebuild it to service the host. Um, if you know, you, you can't have uh, a fit very cleanly between, a, for example, a blade server, which has one or two drive bays, and a hyperconverged model, where you know you look across the floor, the sort of average number of capacity drives is four or five, not to mention the cache drives. Mm -hmm. So a blade server, it's just not a fit. So there's a lot of parts of the industry where that model is just not the right model. Um, you know, if, if everybody's writing to everybody, then there's a lot of neighbor noise, and it gets kind of weird to troubleshoot and tune. Arrays, you know, we're better in some respects. Things change with hyperconverged a little different. We're trying to create a third path. In our model, there's a, a, a box that we sell. It's a 2U rack mount uh, bunch of drives for capacity, but the capacity is just for at rest data. It's where all the writes go. It's where persistence goes. But we move all the data service processing, the CPU for RAID, for compression, for dedupe, whatever, to host cycles. We upload software to an ESX host, and it uses uh, you know, anybody's x86 server, and you bring your own flash for caching. So you know, Gartner did a thing at the end of the year where they looked at discounted street price for flash. The difference between what you could pay on a server for flash, you know, just a commodity SSD, and what you could pay in an array was like an 8x difference. So if you don't, you know, we don't put RAID on the, the host, all the RAID is in the back end. So that frees up another, whatever, 20%. You end up getting an order of magnitude difference in pricing. So what you can get from us in flash on a host is not, you, you don't aim at 10% uh, you know, of your active data in cache, it, it, it gets close to $100 a terabyte. 
after you do dedupe and compression on uh, you know server flash. So it's just cheap and plentiful. You put all your data up there. Everything runs out of flash locally. It never gets a network hit for a read. We do read caching locally. Unlike a hyperconverged, we don't uh, spread data in a pool across the host. We're not interrupting every host for read for writes for uh, you know somebody else. Everything is local. So when you do a write, it goes to our uh, box on the end of the wire on a 10 gig attach, but all of the uh, compute operations are local. So you're not interrupting everybody. All the resourcing you would do for uh, uh, any I.O. problem is a local either cores or flash resourcing. So it's just a different model, and it, you know, it's, yeah. it's really yeah. well suited for blade servers. No one else was doing that in such a good way. Unlike a cache-only product, it's completely organically designed for manageability. You don't have a separate tier for managing on the host, separate from an array, where you know, you're probably duplicating provisioning and uh, having to worry about how to, how to do an array snapshot when you have to flush the cache on the host. It's all completely designed from the ground up. So it means the, the storage that we store to is minimal cost. We don't have the compute overhead that you have with a controller. You don't have the flash, which is really expensive there. That's just cycles on the host. Everything is you know, done with the uh, most efficient uh, path for both data and hardware. So uh, if you look at designs in general, the, the flash has either been a cache, or it's been 100% flash, or it's been uh, a tier. Uh, of storage. So you're, you're, if I understand that correctly, there isn't any tiering because you've got 100% of it in flash. So the, you're, you're, we use, yeah, we use yeah. flash on the host as a cache, right? But only in the sort of, I only use it's that word guardedly cache. in a sort yeah, of degenerate because, case. Yeah. <laughs> it's all of the data. Yeah. So it's a cache in the spirit that if the host dies, you haven't lost any data. The, right. the, the data is always safe somewhere else. Right. But it's all the data. It's all the data, so that's sitting on the disk, uh, the back end. I presume you're writing sequentially to that all the time with log files and, that's right. and using so, the, the disk in the most effective way. That's right, both sides. Uh, mm. Both the flash, it's a right. log structure, and the disk, it's a log both structure. Yeah. And you know, we had the advantage of data domain. It was the most popular mm. log structured file system ever. Mm. And you know, we learned all the tricks about dedupe and garbage collection a long time ago. So right. that CTO team is uniquely qualified to get this right. So, so uh, what about if it does go down? Uh, are you clustering it? Um, uh, what happens when it goes down and you have to recover from those disk drives? That could take a bit of time. Couldn't it? So there's two sides to that. If a host fails, hmm. you, know, you, you use VMHA to restart the VM somewhere else and life goes on. If the back end fails, it fails the way a, a traditional mid-range array might fail. We have dual controllers, so there's fail, fail over there. Yeah. Um, all the disks are dual attached. There's you know dual networks on each controller. You can have you know, switch failover. It's a RAID six, so there's a rebuild that happens if a disk fails. But you could have two of those and keep going. All right. But uh, uh, the point I was getting at was that if you fail in the host, you've lost all your active data. I you've presume lost, at that moment. You've lost the cache copy in that local flash. Yeah. But you haven't lost any data. You haven't lost it. I meant you've lost it from the point of view of being only a, from a the standpoint speed. of speed. Yeah. Yes. So at that point, you know, if the host is down, you have to restart the VM somewhere else. That's not instant. That takes time. some number yeah. of minutes, and that gives yeah. us some time to upload data to that host to okay. new cache. Great. Good. And okay. the data is all laid out in our uh, system, not for interactive use on the disk drives, but for uh, very fast upload to a cache. Right. It's all sort of sequentially laid out, unblended per VM uh, for blasting to. Uh, so what do you see as the key application types that this is going to be particularly suited for? So uh, we have the, our back end system has about 30 terabytes usable after all the you know, RAID and everything. And do dedupe and compression. So we figure you know, 2, 4, 6x data reduction, call it 100 terabytes-ish. Uh, depends on mileage. Uh, so, a hundred terabyte box will, you know, sell. That, that's kind of a mid-range class array. It will sell mostly to those markets, and our software supports only VM storage, virtual disks. Uh, so, as long as it meets those criteria, it's pretty flexible. The host, each host, can have uh, up to eight terabytes of raw flash. 
you know, post dedupe and compression, that could be 50 terabytes of effective capacity of flash per host. And, you know, reads never leave the host, so you don't get right. network uh, uh, overhead for reads, yeah. so that's usually two thirds of most people I own. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. it's enormously price and uh, cost effective. And uh, very performance. You know, performant as well, because right, right, the right. latency stuff. Yeah. And your IP is the way you lay out the data on the media? Is that part of the well, IP? Well, it, listen, it's it's like two custom file systems from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one for the okay. box, one, so one one for the box the guy, and one yeah. for the host. <laughs> Not to mention all the management to make it yeah. look like there's one thing. You know, so it's it, there's a lot going on. It's a much more complex project than Data Domain was. Yeah, so you mentioned, you know, you you learn from your blog structured file garbage collection days of data domain, but the, 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 the problem that you're solving here is you know, much closer to the host, much more active data. Um, so was that obviously a challenge, but so that was part of the new invention required, or was well, it really just directly sort of? I mean, it, it's at all levels. We had to make it fit, uh, so we're very VM centric. It, mm -hmm. it, looks to, the software looks to ESX as though it's an NFS share. Right. But NFS terminates in each host, and then we use our own protocol to get across 10 gig to the back end. And this gives us some special effects we'll be able to talk about over time. Um, so it's every a, a virtual like a Tintra design in some ways. Well, it's it? NFS. Yeah. So, yeah. so you get to see every VM's storage mm -hmm. discreetly. It's sort of a, you know, before VVols, there was NFS. Yes. And right. Uh, so we, su <laughs> we support 5.5, uh, so this was a logical choice. Right. So everything's VM-centric, uh, all of the management, just it just looks like there's a big pool of storage and everything else is per VM, right. uh, from, from diagnostics to capacity planning to whatever, clones are per VM. You don't have to, you know, spend a lot of analytics to figure, you know, back out what the block uh, uh, LUNs look like with respect to the VMs and try to, you know, Work it out. Figure it yeah. out. It's just that's all yeah. there is. So uh, I've talked to a lot of well, Wikibon's been talking to a lot of Flash only people, and this is almost a Flash only in the sense that you are everything is going, uh, all of the I/O is going to that Flash. Once Flash is sufficiently cheap and abundant, yeah. then yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, and we you know we write to NVRAM, which is the same as an all Flash array. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've noticed is that. Uh, what they find is that they have to organize things completely differently, particularly yeah. as they're trying to share things. Um, and uh, for example, instead of having a, the, the production system and then a separate copy for each application developer and another separate copy for, for the, um, uh, for the uh, data warehouse, they're trying to combine those and share the data across there with snapshots of one sort or another. To amortize their very high costs? Uh, just to, because it's much faster <laughs> and quicker. Mean? No, it's, oh, it's the customers are doing this, not, not, the, <laughs> okay. uh, not the, the vendors. They, they don't even know what's going on. Um, so, but because they can share it, it, you don't have to move the data. Well, so it's the, and it allows the developers to have a more current copy of the data so they can yeah. work on near production. Oh, all right, yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering whether that was a, an area that you were looking at to, again, a, a, a apply a different way of doing storage. So it's, know, it's a test dev use case, you're saying? For, yeah, well, for, test dev well, or, sure. or, or data warehousing or yeah, whatever. I mean, we're certainly yeah. sensitive to the overhead of having a lot of copies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we do that's right. dedupe yeah. uh, and, and so on the way we do. So it's but you can go even it's further very efficient, the but it allows yeah. you to, for example, if you're doing a clone, it's a uh, uh, you know a deduped clone, so it's it, it gives you a new namespace entry and it keeps the writes separate, but it uh, hmm. it uh, you know lets the common data the the, the data that with commonality across other versions be consistent. So um, we got to wrap, but uh, yeah. the time we have remaining. So just quick update on the company, headcount, funding, investors, maybe just give us the rundown. Sure, um, we've raised uh, Series A and B. We've raised about 55 million so far. Uh, NEA and Lightspeed, uh, plus some angels, Frank Slootman, uh, Kylie, Diane Green, original founder of VMware, and uh, Ed Bunyan, who was the original CTO. Yeah. Right. Um, about uh, a little over 70 people. Great. And 
Nice this is our first trade show. And, and we're uh, really yeah, excited to be here. awesome. Well, congratulations, Brian. You know, it's really awesome to see you back in, in, in action. Not that you haven't been in action, but now in visible action. So, well, it's great to be here. Yeah, great thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Congratulations. All right, thank you. Keep right there, everybody. We'll be back right after this. This is theCUBE. We're live from VMworld 2015. Be right back.